Welcome, I'm Tim and this is Tim B at Sea. And uh, I figured you guys would want to see the boat that I'm working on now. And those that have been following along the channel know that there's uh, just a couple rules we have. Uh, we try not to directly name the tugs, companies, or customers in the comments or the videos. If it comes out indirectly, uh, you know, like when you key the microphone or something like that. Those things happen but uh anyway we uh can all work around that so please don't get me in trouble it gets me in trouble with my boss if uh we start putting names in in the comments and that sort of thing like that but anyway welcome to this week's video uh i thought that i would take this time while we're at anchor waiting for orders here to show you the boat that i'm on uh the boat that i'm on is very similar from the uh, many people might see it from the out, you know, from the shore, and think it's exactly the same boat as you've been seeing me for the last couple of years up in New York. But the one in New York was actually called what we call a 3,000, and this is called a 4,200. And those are based on how many horsepower they have. So, and it's not the same boat with just more horsepower. They are bigger boats, and I'll go through some of the big differences as we go through the boat. But uh, on the outside, they kind of look the same. To a layman, you might say, oh, that's, that's the same kind of boat. It, it's really not. It's a lot heavier, a lot bigger. bigger. Um, some of my uh, other videos, you've heard me talk about uh, a boat not having the same ass as another boat. That's what we call it, where the boat is heavy enough to be able to pull a barge around as opposed to having the barge there and the boat swinging everything around from the stern. Um, so these boats are much heavier. So to give you an idea, this is uh, roughly, I think it's 95 feet, 100 foot tug. The, the, the length of it is very similar to the other tug. Uh, other than that, things start to change other than the looks. Uh, when it's loaded with fuel and water, we, it draws about 14 or 15 feet. And uh, unlike the other boat that had open wheels, these actually have quart nozzles. And because they have, it's basically the same engines, but instead of being 12 cylinder, they're 16 cylinders. So since there's so much more power, they don't just make the same propellers go faster. What they do is they have a bigger reduction gear and then they go and get much more, much bigger uh, propellers and they put them in a quart nozzle. And I've done a couple videos about quart nozzles, but just to bring those up to speed that aren't familiar with it, a quart nozzle is basically almost like an airplane wing that's wrapped around the propeller and it makes a nozzle so that the water going through is not only directed in one way, but it also produces lift. And so that adds, um, I don't know what, there's, there's a whole lot of debate on how much it, it actually helps. There is no question that they definitely give you a lot more pulling power. They don't speed you up any, and in fact, the reason why you won't see these on any boats that want to go fast is because that they uh, actually... The faster you go, the more, the less efficient they become because it starts to build up drag, you know, going around the, the nozzle. But in the case of a tugboat, to towing, you know, 12,000 tons of cargo and a big heavy barge, you're not going to be going that fast anyway. And in fact, the water, they call it slippage. In other words, a, a, a propeller going through the water with no slip would mean that if it was making rotations to go say five knots and you move through the through the water at five knots there'd be zero percent slip on a tugboat there's a lot of slippage and that's because we're pulling such a great load that in the case that that we're going five knots we might have you know uh 15 or 20 knots of of thrust going through the propeller only to result in five knots of headway and uh that's a result of 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 or that's what they call slippage. But in that scenario where you're towing a great weight and you're not going that fast, a quart nozzle really helps out quite a bit. And like I say, there, it, it, there's a lot of debate on how much it helps, uh, and I think it probably depends on how efficiently they were designed and built as well. 
but I think that I wouldn't be out on a limb if I said you should expect between 10 and 20 percent more pulling power with quart nozzles than you do without them. And so I was saying that there are uh, benefits and, uh, and, and liabilities to having a quart nozzle. The, the, the benefits obviously would be that you pull faster and the liability would be that uh, you start to produce more drag the faster you go, but that's not really a big case for us. The big case for us is that you lose a lot of maneuverability. Uh, not only is the water coming out more straight out of the back of the tug, and we have rudders back there and that sort of stuff, but that's not the big one. The big one is when I've talked about walking a barge and uh, using prop walk, many of you are familiar with prop walk. If you have a traditional uh, boat that usually has a right-handed wheel, once again, let me tell you, if, if you're not familiar with a right-handed wheel, that, mean, that means if the boat's out of water and it's up on, up on land and you're standing behind the boat, if the, the propeller should be uh, going to, to make the boat go forward, generally speaking, the majority of boats out there have what they call a right-handed wheel, and that means the wheel turns clockwise if you're standing behind the boat looking forward. Anyway, um, yeah, why was I telling you that? That's kind of dumb. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, anyway, uh, oh yeah, about prop walk. So if you have a right-handed, if you have a boat with a right-handed wheel, it's normal for you to experience some, or in some cases, a lot of prop walk where the boat, when you put it in reverse, it will actually start to move a little bit to port. And uh, that's something that um, uh, some power boaters are familiar with. A lot of sail boaters are familiar with it just because they have a keel and because they usually don't have, um, it's usually a heavier boat. That, at, at any rate, the, that phenomenon works because of the way the propeller works and it's grabbing free water versus water above, you know, that's, that's being stalled out by the top of the boat. Um, when you have a nozzle, that whole prop walk thing goes away. There is no benefit to going one way or another or having inboard or outboard turning wheels. That kind of goes away. Um, there are some people that will argue and say that it, it doesn't, but I'm saying in, 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 the, in the big case when we talk about losing maneuverability because of court nozzles, it has a lot to do with prop walk. But anyway, we're getting too, too technical on that. You guys don't need to know about that. So. This is standing on the back deck. The Texas bar is over here. I don't know if you can see it, but I'll, I'll bring the camera around here in a little bit. Um, if you look around, you wouldn't be wrong to think that this boat might not be as pretty as the boat that I used to work on. The paint isn't as good. There's a lot of rust on the rails and that sort of thing. You wouldn't be wrong in that. But if you thought it was because of the lack of maintenance or anything like that, you probably might be a little misinformed. The reality is this is a working boat. This is a boat that left the continental United States and came down here to the Caribbean. And uh, a lot of times it's, it's in the morning right now and the wind is probably blowing 15 or 20 right now. And it's going to be blowing, probably yesterday afternoon it was blowing 30, 35 knots in the anchorage. And so everything was covered in spray. So it's very difficult um, for working boats that are working all the time, that aren't in harbors, that aren't in protected waters all the time. To, to have a yacht-like finish. And so when you see a lot of rust, you might think of it as the picture in your yearbook where you had all those guys that had really dirty uniforms and then there was a couple guy that had, guys that might have played football that had a really clean uniform. That clean guy wasn't special. He was just the guy that rode the bench. The guys with the dirty uniforms were the guys that were getting the job done. And that's kind of the case here. So you might see things that look a little rusted or whatever. It's because this is a working boat. It doesn't, it doesn't take the benefit of being in the harbor. But anyway, as you can see, you might have heard me talk about the other boat that uh, I, I was never really impressed with the winches they had. And they, we didn't need big winches because most of the work we did was in push gear. But this is a proper, what we call a double drum winch. This is, uh, it has a big uh, six cylinder diesel that runs the air over hydraulics and a, a drive system that drives this. There's two spools of wire. They can they run independently. You can see we have a, a soft line over here. And that soft line is it's it's actually the uh, 
you know, it's a synthetic line. It's the Amstel Blue, so it's really super strong. That's actually probably stronger than the huge diameter wire that we have here. Right now we're just at anchor, so everything's over the side and we're just sitting here. But uh, you can see we have one drum for the wire, the other one for the soft line. But uh, the soft line just has a few wraps of that because we don't use, we don't, we don't go for, you know, my, like this, probably 2,500 feet of wire on this over here. And uh, underneath the soft line over here, there's wire there as well. So it's nice to have it for redundancy, but it's also nice to have it so that you don't have to go and use the capstan whenever you need something. Or in this case, if we need to tighten up on the stern line, we don't have to do it and put a big strain and an angle on the wire because that wouldn't be good. We can do it with a soft line. And uh, I got to tell you, in my experience, these winches are amazing. They're, uh, they're, they are amazing. You can almost, uh, the way these are configured right here, I think if you had a strong enough wire and a place to tie it to, you could pull the boat right out of water, right up on the land with it. These winches are so strong. But they're great. And uh, let me show you some, the rest of this. We, uh, as you can see, we have our push gear, just like the other boat was set up. Um, here's the Texas bar over here. Our uh, barge is here. Like I say, we're waiting for orders. Let me walk you around here. You see these right here? This is something that uh, we use for when we're when we're uh, towing. Um, sometimes you'll see like when we're backing out around a barge, and uh, the wire will come over here. On some boats, sometimes the wire will come over here, and if it gets over here, it's really hard to get the wire off. Remember that the wire and the bridle and everything that you're doing um, weighs a tremendous amount, like a few tons. So the, this right here is just so that we can pay out the wire while we're backing up and the wire can hit here and it won't go any further. So it's the kind of little safety measure that uh, not all tugboats have, but uh, I, when I first came to this company, I thought they were kind of, I was like, oh boy, these are, for, these are like training wheels. Well, it turns out that after you use them for a long time, you really end up liking them. As you can see here, um, you can actually see where they they put a uh, weld on here to build this up and you can see where the wire has ground some of it out and that that's not you can also see things here like I say as 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 this the rust on here should not you should not be thinking this is poorly maintained it's that we're in a saltwater environment and if you scrape off the paint and about a few hours later things are going to rust but the thing you should notice I hope it comes up on camera is let me see yeah here we go see this right here this is the rail of, of the normal boats over here you can see they've put a almost like a a, um, a rail you know from a from a train a, a, a train track almost and then filled it up with all these welds and the reason why they do that is that when you round up on a barge and you pull wire over the side you need almost like a sacrificial thing so that it cuts into here and it doesn't cut into our rail so that's what you have over there uh, very cool like I say uh, these are all things that, that are the makings of a real offshore tug now we do have a capstan over here should we need it and uh, let me come up the side of the boat here hydrant over here now some people ask what these things are these are all vents for the different tanks on the boat and uh, you you have to have ta you have to have vents but the vents have to be have to have like a, a floating ball in them and this is so that in the hopefully never in the case that it never happens but if the boat were to go down you wouldn't want I mean this boat holds 89 or 90 thousand gallons of fuel you wouldn't want in addition to losing your boat but also having a huge environmental negative impact so all these vents have to have these brass balls that will float up and seal seal everything and keep the the a, a leak out and so that's what they're for but see around here this is the fore deck the h bit give you an idea of how how big the h bit is uh i used to say i was 510 years ago i think i was just looking at my licenses and all that but now i'm more closer to 59 i think i'm good i, I I don't know if I'm shrinking or if it's just that I'm settling because I seem to be getting wider. <laughs> but anyway, the reason why I point this out is that uh, some people ask me about the physical demands of working on deck on a tugboat. And there are some things that you just can't get over. Um, you don't have to be the strongest person in the world 
but these are big heavy lines. These lines right here are under pressure. Here, here's a better, better look at the size of them. So right here, you have to lift this up and over that, and you, and, and you can see, that in this case, we've got a double line going way out there. It's a lot of weight. So you have to be able to be, may, make sure that that's something that you can do. Anyway, here's the H-bit. This right here, we call that the bull, no, bull nose. And uh, if you hear a noise, there's a noise going, Arrgh. That noise is actually down in our forepeak. You'll see it later, but we're making water right now. So our, our desalination plant is actually bringing in salt water, and it brings it up to a, a, just over 800 pounds per square inch, puts it through a membrane, and I think, I think like 98% of the water goes back overboard, but like 2% of the water comes back to us in the way of fresh water. Anyway, come back down the other side of the boat. You can see more vents over here. And we're back. Then I'll take you back. Let me take you over to the what we call the O1 deck. Here's the back of the winch. Oh, by the way, you know there was something that I wanted to say in, in uh, a couple of the other videos that you saw people working out on deck. One of the things that we never do is we never walk underneath the wire. So if we're working on, if we're working over here, excuse me, I'm holding my microphone thing. If we uh, if we're working over here and we want to get over there, we walk underneath it. But that's how you die. So you'll see everybody will come around here and they actually walk all the way around and they'll come up on this side and work on the wire over here. And so uh, that's why we do that because uh, the wire will cut people in half and it's uh, really kind of awful. Anyway, um, look while I'm here, I'll tell you these are other different things where we can take on gear oil and lube oil and suck out the slop tanks. The slop tanks are where we carry the old dirty oil that we don't want. Many people have asked where our anchor is on our boat. Here, We're required by law to have an anchor. Here's our anchor. And uh, people say, well, how would you deploy that? Well, there's a couple ways. We could put it to the soft line on the, on the winch, or we could even put it to the wire on the winch and anchor up backwards. Or we could put it to one of our soft lines and put it out the bow if we had to do that, but it'd be more difficult to retrieve that way but in reality we really have an anchor more for compliance than actually using it I can tell you that in my years of being on a tugboat I have never anchored a tug with the anchor alone we usually anchor the the barge is set up for that so the barge anchors with a giant anchor that weighs more than a couple of cars and then we just anchor, we tie up to the barge um, I a place I used to work at before I worked at this company I've even done something where they call uh, laying on the wire, and that's where you put the put the barge out and you you just dump a whole bunch of wire in a big circle, uh, you know, a, a big U shape. Then you come back to the barge, and the weight of the wire, if it's not a rocky bottom, if it's a sandy bottom or whatever, if it's a rocky bottom, you'll definitely stop it. You might not get the wire up, but uh, a sandy bottom, just that weight of the wire will hold you there. And that's that, that's a technique that you don't see as used as much today, but uh, years ago that was something that a lot of people did. But anyway, um, we have. Uh, well, you know what? Why don't I take you back up here? Probably speed all this up just because this is boring for you. But back up here in the bow, we have stairs coming up. You can see we have ladders. And uh, the reason why these ladders are here is because the boat, as you can see, see the boat moving up and down all this time? That would be really hard to what we call foot a ladder. If you would have to, if you were going up and down um, like this and uh, it wasn't secured like this, that would be very tough. Now we have it tied off there so anybody on the barge can pull that line and they'll have access to drop the ladder down. But we don't let the ladder make contact with the barge if no one's there. That way it won't get tangled up and you run the risk of bending the ladder if it gets hung up on anything. So this is what we call the doghouse. Doghouse is the steering station. We have full control for steering, running the throttles, and then this right over here is, is running the winch. This does one drum, this does the other drum, and uh, we could do everything right from here. We've got a whole radio suite here and all that kind of stuff. Ten man life raft, spill kit, emergency equipment, 
firefighting stuff, paint locker, and uh, one thing that I think is pretty cool about this, I think I showed this in another video, but if you notice, our paint locker here has a fire extinguisher that you can't take away. The idea is if you ever had anything that was on fire in the paint locker, like spontaneous combustion, that's a real, that's a real threat. You don't want to open it up and feed it full of oxygen, so this thing is already set. So you pull the pen, you dump it, you're going to dump all that CO2 right into the box. So it's all set to go. And uh, that's kind of cool. Here's an EPIRB, an automatic deployed EPIRB. This is the hydrostatic release on the life raft. And what that means is that if we were to go down and uh, nobody was able to get the life raft out, I think it's three meters, but whenever it gets down to a certain depth, that hydrostatic relief uh, release cuts a little line and the whole life raft floats up to the surface and you can get onto it. So that's that. If you notice, see these vents right here? These are exhaust vents. I say exhaust, I'm, I'm not saying exhaust from the engine, I'm saying that the air comes out of those, where these are intake vents. And if you notice, they've got stainless steel things all the way around them. See these T-handles and all this? And the reason why is that you don't want these to freeze up. In the event of a, of a engine room fire, our best way of fighting fire is by eliminating the oxygen. And we have a huge CO2 system that I'll show you here in a bit, but that will be ineffective because we have huge fans that suck in cold air and push hot air out through these over here. So uh, the first thing that we do is we have to secure the um, ventilation system and close all the, the inlets and outlets. So they have to be stainless steel so that we can they won't rust up and the, you know we exercise them almost once a week. We, when I say exercise them, what I'm saying is that we, we move the doors open and shut so that they're not stiff with corrosion or salt or anything like that. Anyway, all the way up there is the upper house. And uh, you know what, I could show you the upper house, but the upper house is nearly identical to the one that you've been seeing all these years at the other boat. So I don't know that it's worth it to show you that. We're just burning up time here. I can take you over here and show you in the wheelhouse. Now it looks awful dark in here and that's because we have these nice shades on the window here. We get shades all the way around here so that's why it's kind of dark. But uh... That's just personal preference. It's not, not nothing that's uh, a big deal. But anyway, as you can see, everything looks very similar. Um, you might not notice it on camera, but the smaller boats actually have higher wheelhouses. So, for example, I can touch the ceiling here, and I'd never be able to do that on the boat that I used to work on. And in other words, their windows were bigger and all that stuff. Um, somebody had just written in one of the comments about uh, that they were watching one of my videos offshore saying everything's all right until you lose a window meaning a, a wave comes and hits you well bear in mind that we're about 25 feet above the water and these windows are supposed to be bulletproof you know as part of our security thing here so if we lost a window all the way up here we might already be in deep doo-doo already so hopefully that will never ever happen <laughs> hopefully we'll never be in a situation where that could be it but as you can see this all looks should look very familiar to what you what everyone's seen before and I've answered this 10,000 times in the comments probably come up again what are these things everybody asks what are these things these are the horizontal and vertical controls for the searchlights we've got two searchlights on the bottom and the lower wheelhouse and one searchlight in the upper house and one searchlight back in the doghouse so you spin the wheel one way and the light goes like this you spin the wheel the other way and it goes like that so that's what those are for then over here, you can see we have a whole bunch of uh, procedures and stuff, and then we have a whole communication suite over there and uh, all kinds of good stuff. Other than that, everything else should look very similar. You know what? I probably really should have cleaned my room to show you this, but here's my head. See a nice little head shower. Here's my room over here. Everything, excuse the mess. Everything's a mess right here. So it's laundry day for me, so I'm getting ready to do laundry. But that's my room. And then when we go down below, we're into the galley. Here's our galley. Got all the amenities when it comes to dishwasher. Uh, 
osmosis uh, water filter, all the different gadgets for cooking. We've got, we have to have a whole bunch of freezer space and a whole bunch of food space because we're feeding everybody for three weeks straight. When we're out here, we can't really go to the, go to the store every time, so we have to get stuff. Over here we have an ice maker and a coffee pot that's always on. Some people like the one pot things, that's fine. A drink cooler. Here's where we, our galley table. We're uh, lucky to have satellite TV on here so that uh, we stay informed. I come up here. I gotta talk a little quieter because uh, the other crew, the other side of the watch is sleeping. But this is the crew's head down here. And they, when I say my head and their head, it's just that I live up on that floor and they live down on this floor. They're more than welcome to use mine. It's not segregated like that. And over here is the engineer's room. And then we have a deckhand's room and a meat's room. And like I say, I'm just talking quietly because I uh, don't want to uh, make anybody wake anybody up. Now let me take you into what we call the fiddly. So you'll notice that we have two different doors. They're both watertight doors. And that way, the noise at the end won't go through and get into the galley. It's a nice little airlock as well. So this is called the Fiddly. The Fiddly is the upper engine room. The noise that you're hearing is the generator. Um, we, have a, we, have, you know, we have a couple generators and uh, they're running all the time. Uh, well, one's running all the time. And uh, you can see we have everything that we need up here. From uh, firefighting equipment to repair stuff. We just got a new cooler because here in Puerto Rico when we go shopping, it's almost an hour away and we have to get it out of the boat. Here are the air over hydraulics. Um, we have a, a whole laundry system. Each, each hitch has their own freezer. So one side has a freezer, and you know, like my crew has a freezer, and the other crew has a freezer. And, and usually what happens is when you have two good crews that work together, you don't have bacon, you, borrow, you take one out of the other guy's freezer, but then you return it. So that usually works pretty well with most crews. Anyway, here's our laundry. I'm going to take you down to the engine room. It's going to be noisy, so I'll just shut up, take some pictures, and uh, do a voiceover. So down into the engine room we go. Chief is over here doing some maintenance. This over here on the left-hand side, these series that those right there, those are all uh, our fuel, uh, the fuel manifolds, so we can change everything around. This right here is our multi-point panel. This allows us to have an unmanned engine room because it's monitoring all those different things. Here are the Caterpillar uh, 3516s. Now if you notice these three Raycor filters here, they're actually not used like in series or parallel. Two of them are, are in parallel. So we use two at a time and then when the, the vacuum gauge shows that there's enough of a resistance, then you flip, you turn on the clean filter and change out the other two and then swap it back. And then after this, I was pointing over there that there was a, uh, a filter right on the engine too that's extremely fine for sure that we have really clean fuel on there. Over here is where our uh, coolant lines go outside to the heat exchangers that are on the outside of the hull. Well, I say the outside of the hull, there's an indentation in the hull that they, that they go on. In other words, we don't bring salt water in through a heat exchanger on the engine. We put our, our coolant outside. And there's going to be uh, a heat exchanger for the main engines, for the reverse gears, and one uh, for each generator as well. Got all kinds of tools over here, everything that we need. You'll notice there's almost two of everything. Uh, air compressor over here. I'm trying to show you, I can't really, that didn't really come out well, but uh, I'm trying to show you the shaft is underneath here. Each shaft is, I think, 12 or 14 inches uh, across. I mean, they're, they're really big. This bulkhead has a series of different tanks for lube oil and hydraulic oil and slop tanks. Um, those are the two generators we have. Our chief just switched over from one generator to the other, so he's writing on uh, Sharpie and some tape that he puts the time and the dates on things so that not only will it be in the logbook, but it'll be written there as well. And um, over here is the tow engine. This is the six-cylinder diesel that uh, 
runs that incredibly powerful winch. These are, the, once again, a shot of the two generators. I think they're 99 kW apiece. You can see each engine has two uh, twin turbos on each one. There's another air compressor in our steering system. You can see there's the common theme you should notice is that there's two of everything here. Um, we just showed you a uh, steering station so that in the event of something going catastrophically wrong, they could steer the boat from down here. Um, now you can see this side of the engines have been painted, so they're slowly starting to paint from one side to the other. And what I'm trying to tell you right here is that it's hard to go and just shut everything down and paint the whole engine room uh, all, all at once, paint the engine and all that. So what they do is when they have a freeze time and they get everything right, they'll paint one side of the engine, then they'll do the other side and that, so forth and so on. Then I was just showing you the starter, and what makes the starter special is that it doesn't start with electricity like your starter in your car would, but rather with compressed air. Now these manifolds over here are for man uh, the ballast and fire pumps, so that we can ballast with water and suck out of different compartments if we had a leak. Then we go up in here. This is where the two, this is the, the alley that goes in between the two there's a there's a center tank underneath us, but they've got, I think they're, I don't even know, I don't even want to say, I, I want to say like four or six thousand gallon day tanks to each one of them. And for those that don't know, the reason why you have day tanks is, um, remember I said that we had like 89 or 90 thousand gallons of fuel on board? You don't have it in one tank, they have it in, there's a whole bunch of tanks all throughout the boat. I think it's a total of eight or nine, ten tanks, something like that. Anyway, we ballast the boat with the fuel, we move it around. But in the event that you pulled out of one tank that you hadn't pulled out of for a long time and it had bad fuel, you wouldn't you want to be able to switch to something else that was clean fuel again. So what they do is they have what they call day tanks. When we pull out of out of one of the fuel tanks, it goes through a really good super filter. And I think in the yachting world they call this uh, polishing fuel. It'll go through polish the fuel and put it into the day tank. Now we know that we've got, what we call a day tank, it's probably about two or three days worth of fuel in each one of the day tanks, but we have fuel and that fuel has been cleaned and it's ready to go. When we go to get other fuel, then we can worry about that as well. Now here, we are in the four peak. It's really noisy because we're making water, but we have things like, this is our fresh water plant right here. Uh, not our plant, but our uh, hot water heater, pressure pumps, and you can see that we have we have stuff stowed all over everywhere because the boat basically goes away for two years and doesn't come home again. So we need to be able to carry all the stuff that we need. And we have stuff like this. I've pointed that these before, but that right there is a water sensor. If any water gets here on deck, it'll send an alarm so that we're always watching these things. And if you say, how's water going to get down here? Well, it could get down through the hatch or some other way. But more than likely, because we're standing on the water tanks, the fresh water tanks, some of these end up leaking sometimes, and so uh, we have to have a way of watching these sorts of things and let us know. Over here is our CO2 system, and we have uh, CO2 to uh, fight fire, more spill containment stuff, spares. This is actually a breathing operation. This is not a Scott Air Pack. You don't fight a fire with this, but this is if you're here, there's a fire you need to get out. It'll give you air to escape with. More spare parts, everything you could ever want, plumbing. These are all our spare lines, more plumbing fittings. Over here is our uh, water maker, currently making water, buffering some of the wind. Primary sand filter. I think it's a uh, 10 length one or 1 length one filter. It's going to have to have one length one. And a little sterilizer. More spare parts over here. And then this is the access to get out to the up to the bow. And that's about it. So now you've seen everything. Oh, and then of course this. This deals with, uh, this is our sewage treatment plant. <laughs> so uh, that's about it. And uh, hope you guys like it. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this sort of video, maybe you can think about subscribing. It really helps out. It's a free way to do it. And uh, remember that we do put out new videos every Tuesday. And special thanks to my patrons. The patrons are people that make all these videos possible. They give between two and ten dollars a month, and uh, 
You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. If you'd like to be a member of the Patreon team, there's a link in the description, and uh, or you could just go to patreon.com forward slash Tempe at C. You guys say stay safe, and uh, as always, I'll see you on the one.